Welcome to Workday's second quarter fiscal year 2022 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will conduct a question and answer session towards the end of the call. I will now hand it over to Mr. Justin Furby, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you, Operator. Welcome to Workday's second quarter fiscal 2022 earnings conference call. On the call, we have Anil Bushri and Shana Fernandez, our co-CEOs, Robin Sisko, our President and CFO, and Peach Slamp, our Executive Vice President of Product Development. Following prepared remarks, we will take questions. Our press release was issued after close of market and is posted on our website, where this call is being simultaneously webcast. Before we get started, we want to emphasize that some of our statements on this call, particularly our guidance, are based on the information we have as of today and include forward-looking statements regarding our financial results, applications, customer demand, operations, and other matters. These statements are subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions, including those related to the impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic on our business and global economic conditions. Please refer to the press release and the risk factors and documents we file with the Securities and Exchange Commission including our 2021 annual report on Form 10-K and most recent quarterly report on Form 10-Q for additional information on risks, uncertainties, and assumptions that may cause actual results to differ materially from those set forth in such statements. In addition, during today's call, we will discuss non-GAAP financial measures, which we believe are useful as supplemental measures of Workday's performance. These non-GAAP measures should be considered in addition to and not as a substitute for or in isolation from GAAP results. You can find additional disclosures regarding these non-GAAP measures, including reconciliations with comparable GAAP results, in our earnings press release and on the investor relations page of our website. The webcast replay of this call will be available for the next 90 days on our company website under the investor relations link. Also, the customers page of our website includes a list of selected customers and is updated monthly. Our third quarter quiet period begins on October 16, 2021. Unless otherwise stated, all financial comparisons in this call will be to our results for the comparable period of our fiscal 2021. With that, I will hand the call over to Anil. Thank you, Justin, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our second quarter fiscal year 22 earnings call. I'm pleased to report that Q2 was one of our strongest quarters in company history. When combined with Q1, this was the best first half of the year in terms of ACV growth in over three years. We came into the year expecting our business to accelerate, but the pace of digital acceleration across HR and finance is exceeding even our own expectations. Our leadership position continues to strengthen, driven by a broadening of our product portfolio and exceptional execution. The growing Workday customer community now includes 55 million users and 50% of the Fortune 500, of which approximately 90% are live on Workday. Channel will share more shortly on our go-to-market success, and Robin will provide specifics in our raised growth outlook for the second half of the year. But let me share first some of the highlights from Q2. Let's start with Workday HCM. Our position as an innovator and market leader with our differentiated suite of products has never been stronger. We continue to attract new customers, and many of our current customers continue to grow their investments with us. In Q2, we welcome CVS Health, Iberdrola, Vallejo Management Services, California Pizza Kitchen, and Heidelberg Cement AG to the Workday family, along with many other new HCM customers. While these new wins are very important to us, we remain equally focused on delivering excellent service to our current customers, and that includes delivering on our commitments to them. Amongst the many go lives of Q2, I would like to highlight Harmon International Industries, BJ's Wholesale Club, and Old Dominion. In addition to the strong growth from Core HCM, this was our first full quarter with Pecan. I'm pleased to report we got off to a great start delivering the largest quarter in Pecan history with early success selling back into our installed base, a true testament to the incredible Pecan product and even better Pecan team. We also continue to see strong traction for our financial management suite of applications. We believe that a combination of our expanded set of offerings, including planning, spend management, and accounting center, 
and the acceleration of digital transformations by the Office of the CFO are collectively driving broader adoption of our finance offerings. In fact, the highlight in Q2 was a nearly 50% ACV growth in the workday adaptive planning business, showcasing our strategy of meeting customers where they are continues to drive significant success. In addition, we continue to see momentum build in our core financial deployments. New core financial customers in Q2 included Cinemark USA, University of Wisconsin System, and Wise Markets. Notable core fins go live included the University of Southern California, KeyBank North America, and Fox Corporation. Moving on to the innovation front, we are focused on broadening our platform and extending our product capabilities to create additional levers for long-term growth. As a recent example, and to continue seizing on the great opportunity we have internationally, this quarter we announced our intent to deliver workday payroll for Australia and Germany. As you know, our country-specific payrolls are very compelling to customers, and we're excited to deliver these new solutions as levers of growth for these markets. We also recently announced that Workday has achieved ready status for the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program, or FedRAMP, at a moderate impact level, with full authority to operate estimated for spring 2022. With this achievement, we materially advance our position to help federal agencies accelerate digital transformation in order to help them modernize their business systems and gain real-time insights to address critical challenges across their organizations. Switching to the people front, we continue to invest heavily in our company culture to sustain our belief that happy employees deliver the highest levels of satisfaction to our great customers. On that note, starting in Q4 of this year, we'll be extending a cash bonus plan company-wide to further ensure our people feel valued, motivated, and properly recognized. Robin will update you later on our margin expectations for the back half of the year. This is a direct reflection of our business momentum and the confidence we have in our workmates to grow the business to $10 billion in revenues and beyond. With our outstanding first half of fiscal year 22, we are seeing acceleration in our business. As I look ahead, my optimism for Workday's future couldn't be higher. We have a great team in place and a significant global opportunity in front of us as companies continue to embark on their HR and finance transformation journeys. With that, I'll turn it over to our co-CEO, Chano Fernandez. Over to you, Chano. Thank you, Anil, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. As Anil mentioned, we had a fantastic Q2 driven by very strong execution, which combined with a rapidly improving demand environment for enterprise management cloud solutions is causing our net new business to accelerate at an even faster pace than we expected. A strength in Q2 was broad-based, highlighted by large enterprise outperformance and solid growth in landing new core HR and FINS customers. We also saw a strength landing new customers across our expanded portfolio of solutions targeting the office of the CFO and CHRO. For example, our planning and workday ex strategic sourcing businesses drove significant strength in winning new large enterprise customers in Q2, including the largest planning first deal in our history. And Picon drove significant new logo activity in EMEA, providing us a gateway into selling core HCM and FINS solutions over time. In addition to solid performance from our land sales team, the momentum we've been seeing with our customer base team also continued in Q2, as companies look to Workday as a trusted strategic partner. We had another quarter of strong renewal performance, and our customer base team drove strength cross-selling a number of solutions, such as core fins, planning, spend management, help, PCOM, extend, and our talent portfolio. For example, in planning, we signed add-on deals with Google, with one of the world's largest telecommunication companies and a Fortune 100 distribution company. And in spend management, we had a number of add-ons wins at companies such as Bond Secures, Mercy Health, CME Group, and Ralph Lauren. We also had a number of notable extend customer space wins in the quarter, including a Fortune 100 manufacturer a Fortune 50 energy company, and one of the world's largest banks. And Picom isn't just landing new logos. It is a powerful solution to sell back to our customers. We had notable add-on deals this quarter, including Update and Perkin Elmer. From a geographic standpoint, 
our performance was strong globally with North America outperforming across all segments, including significant strength from our large and medium enterprise teams and from industries such as healthcare and higher education. In international markets, EMEA was a standout, driving healthy acceleration in new ACV bookings with particular outperformance in continental Europe, including outstanding performance in France and Spain. We are seeing improving market dynamics and pipeline momentum across our rest of world region. And we expect those trends to continue as we move into the back half of the year. As we've discussed over the last few quarters, we're investing aggressively in our go-to-market effort. Our largest area of headcount investment in the first half of FY22 was in sales and marketing as we added significant new global sales capacity across both our net new and installed based teams, including a doubling down in international markets. We're also accelerating our spend across key brand and marketing initiatives. These investments, which we expect will continue in the second half of the year, are focused on driving growth in FY23 and beyond. And we are very pleased with the evolution we are seeing in our pipeline, which again saw solid growth in Q2. In closing, I would like to thank the more than 13,000 global workmen who have enabled us to drive such a strong Q2 and first half results. Our broad and differentiated suite of solutions is winning in the market, and we're incredibly well positioned as we enter the second half of the year. Let's keep the momentum going. And now I will turn it over to our president and CFO, Robin Cisco. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, Chano, and good afternoon, everyone. As Neil and Chano mentioned, we delivered an incredibly strong Q2, driven by exceptional execution against a rapidly improving market backdrop as organizations accelerate the pace of digital transformation across HR and finance. Subscription revenue in the second quarter was $1.11 billion, up 20% year-over-year, driven by very strong new business sales, favorable in-quarter linearity, and an overperformance on customer renewals, with gross retention once again over 95%. Professional services revenue was $147 million, resulting in total revenue of $1.26 billion. Revenue outside the U.S. was $318 million, up 24% year-over-year and representing 25% of the total. 24-month backlog at the end of the second quarter was $6.88 billion, growth of 19%. Total subscription revenue backlog was $10.58 billion, up 23%. Our non-GAAP operating income for the second quarter was $292 million, resulting in a non-GAAP operating margin of 23%. Margin over achievement was driven by a combination of top line outperformance and favorable expense variances. Operating cash flow in Q2 was 198 million, growth of 26%. In addition to strong profitability from our core operations, during Q2 we also recognized a nearly $100 million mark to market gain from the successful IPO of one of our ventures portfolio companies. We will continue to see mark-to-market adjustments from our equity investments, but we expect gains of this magnitude will be extremely rare. Our largest investments continue to be in our people and in attracting top talent to work day. In the first half of the year, we successfully added and integrated more than 900 net new employees, bringing our total employee count to over 13,400 at the end of Q2. We've made important progress towards our full year target of adding 2,500 employees and expect the pace of hiring to increase throughout the back half of FY22. Overall, we're extremely pleased with the momentum we saw in Q2 and we're very well positioned as we enter the important back half of the year. Now turning to guidance. Based on our strong Q2 and the momentum we're seeing in our business, we are raising our FY22 outlook and providing Q3 guidance as follows. For subscription revenue, we're raising our full year estimate to be in the range of 4.50 billion, 
to 4.51 billion, 19% growth. For Q3, we expect subscription revenue of 1.156 billion to 1.158 billion, 20% growth at the high end, and we expect 24 months backlog growth of 19%. We still expect professional services revenue to be 590 million in FY22 as we continue to prioritize driving the highest levels of customer success. For Q3, we expect professional services revenue of 150 million. Investing for growth remains our number one priority. In addition to the increased pace of hiring in the back half of FY22, we also expect to ramp non-headcount spending with investments specifically targeted at accelerating demand generation, enhancing our market position, and advancing our strategic product roadmap. Additionally, the new bonus plan that Neil mentioned will take effect on November 1st and is expected to impact our Q4 margins by approximately 300 basis points. Given that backdrop, we expect non-GAAP operating margins of 21% in Q3, 16% in Q4, and 21% for the full year. The GAAP operating margin is expected to be lower than the non-GAAP margin by approximately 24 percentage points in Q3 and 25 percentage points in Q4 and for the full year. Given our strong performance, we are also raising our FY22 operating cash flow guidance to 1.5 billion. We continue to expect 270 million of other capital investments to support our customer growth and continued business expansion. I'll close by thanking our amazing employees, customers, and partners for their continued support and hard work. We're off to a very strong start in the first half of the year, and our focus remains on driving accelerated bookings growth. We look forward to hosting our virtual analyst day on September 21st, where we will share insights on our strategic innovation and growth initiatives as we look ahead to FY23 and beyond. With that, I'll turn it over to the operator to begin Q&A. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in a question queue. You may press star two if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Your first question comes from the line of Kirk Matern with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Sure. Thanks very much, and uh, congrats on, on a really good quarter. Great to see the acceleration in ACV growth. Uh, Anil and Shano, I was wondering, can you just talk a little bit more about what you've seen over the last six months? I know you're both more upbeat about the pipeline heading into this year, but when you talk about a quarter of this magnitude from a growth perspective, can you talk about maybe what happened in the quarter that you weren't expecting, whether it was deals coming in at a faster cadence, deal cycles you know, getting shorter, uh, deals growing perhaps at the end of the deal, meaning more add-ons, more multi-product deals. I was wondering if you just add a little bit more color to that and, and, and kind of why do you see that, uh, you know, continuing into the back half of the year? What gives you confidence around the pipeline? Thanks. So I'll just make a couple of comments about what I hear from other CEOs, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Chano. Uh, you know, for the most part, CEOs are pretty optimistic about, about the future of their business, and they also realize that they have to jump on board of the of, – digital transformation for both HR and finance. So despite what's been going on with the pandemic, the mindset is back to business. And so we saw that in the pipeline and we saw it in people taking actions. They're not sitting on the sidelines anymore. And, and maybe Chano can add to that. Hi, Kirk. Hope you're well. Um, I think to unpack a little bit the strength in, in Q2 was, was truly broad-based, highlighted by solid growth in landing new core HR and fin customers. Um, and we have significant strength across the business, as we mentioned, but I would call out, would call out the large enterprise team as a key outperformer. Uh, there was also a strong uh, performance across regions, particularly with a healthy bounce back in EMEA and continental Europe. And we also saw good dynamics in terms of landing uh, new products within the office of the CFO. And Fins and Fins Plus were good contributors as well. 
And last but not least, there was solid performance on our install based teams and, and renewals. So as a whole, it was um, quite across the board, uh, very positive. Um, and I would just highlight with Anil said, like this acceleration of digital transformation initiatives coming back to the table and really is coming back uh, across uh, financials and HTN. That at least is what we're seeing, um, what it is reflected as well in the pipeline when we look at the second half. If I could just have one follow-up for, for Robin. Robin, you know, obviously a really impressive quarter across the board. When we look at the CRPO growth of 24-month backlog, I assume that still has some of that headwind from the expiry base on it. So you know, if we're going to apples to apples it, that, that would probably have been you know, above 20% on this quarter if we, we try to normalize for that. Is that fair? And I assume that expiry base headwind should dissipate a little bit as we get into fiscal 23. Thanks. Yeah, Kirk, what we discussed last quarter still holds, which is that we're seeing an impact of roughly a couple points to the 24-month backlog throughout FY22. And you're correct that we don't expect that dynamic in FY23 at all. And just as a reminder, this dynamic has no impact on new ACV bookings, subscription revenue, or how we run the business. And our focus continues to be on accelerating our new ACV bookings. We're really pleased with our progress on that front, and you're seeing that show up in the backlog growth numbers, even despite the headwinds that we have this year on renewals. Great. Thank you all. Your next question comes from the line of Brad Sills with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Oh, great. Thanks so much for taking my question, and congratulations on a, on a real nice Q2. Um, I wanted to ask a question that kind of goes back to comments you've made last quarter, uh, Anil, around really the strategy with FIN is to surround the account, surround the transactional system with some of these peripheral systems. You're seeing real strength in planning. It sounds like procurement is really ramping. At what point, you know, is there a, uh, you know, a, a potential – uh, migration that happens when when you have is it you know one or two of these modules they're running you know, for a year or more um, you know is there a certain tipping point when you, you might expect some of those conversions on the core transactional system over time thank you well it, de it definitely doesn't hurt to have a uh, combination of HCM uh, maybe a few financial modules in there but I think the, the more important dynamic is that as uh, as we as we exit running the businesses for the pandemic and, and try to run business in a, in a more normalized way, the demand for core financial systems is coming back. And we saw that, we saw that this quarter. It was a strong quarter for core financial systems. We saw, we saw the entry point with planning being up over 50% as a really strong indicator of what, of what we might see over the next few quarters. So it's, it's really it's more than just one dynamic. It's, it's across the board. So we saw strength in the add-on modules. We also did see strength in core accounting as well. I'd, I'd like to highlight Accounting Center as a really important product for, uh, for some of the large volume uh, uh, customers we have out there, in particular in areas like financial services, a product that continues to get great traction and great reviews, just opening up more doors for us uh, for, for core accounting. That's great to hear. And one, one more, if I may, please. And, you know, in the past... Uh, you know, about a year ago, you, you, you talked about some pandemic headwinds. Since then, you've obviously seen those uh, improve. Um, what are you hearing from you know, the office of the HR manager and the office of the CFO in terms of, you know, willingness to make investments now in digital transformation now that we're kind of exiting things? But clearly, your results are showing that, uh, that those projects are coming back in the back office. I mean, I, I think the mindset uh, for companies that hadn't gone through the transformation was that it was really hard to run their business with a remote workforce uh, or a hybrid workforce uh, or whatever model they had to go to without the flexibility uh, and, and, uh, and ability to work from home with that cloud systems like Workday offer. If you're on legacy systems, it was a really hard time. And so I think folks have said, hey, uh, even if we are still dealing with some of the issues around the pandemic, we gotta get on, we gotta get on with it. We gotta move on to the modern systems. And, and that's, that's been a real big driver for us. Great to hear. Thanks so much, Anil. Your next question comes from the line of Keith Weiss with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Excellent. Thank you guys for taking the question. Uh, and a very nice quarter. Um, a couple of questions, kind of, or multi-part question, digging into kind of the, the nature of the strength that you guys have been seeing in, in this first half of, of the year. 
and, and it's really in, in, in two parts. One, in terms of is what you're seeing just kind of a release of pent up demand? Like last year was uh, calendar 20 was a very difficult year to get these big enterprise uh, transactions um, across the line. So I'm assuming a lot of it was kind of pent up in the pipeline. Or is, is there more of a combination of sort of pent up demand and sort of new business coming into the pipe or sort of uh, new digital transformation initiatives getting an extra kind of boost uh, given what happened last year? And then similarly, Last year, one of the real bright spots was how well the upsell motion, the into the base motion, uh, uh, propped up overall growth for for for, for the company. Um, has that sustained uh, with sort of new business ramping up? Have you been able to keep that good balance of new business in the door as well as upsells uh, in in into FY22? Thank you. I'll take the first part. Uh, I, I think it is a bit of both. There's no question there was some pent-up demand that's impacted the first half of the year. But I, I really think the pandemic uh, for, forced a, a, a sea change and, and, a, and a change in mindset about how quickly uh, people had to get into the into the cloud and move, move into the digital transformation projects for HR and finance. So while it might have slowed down last year, I think it's picked up, and now I think it's going to be that way going forward. And uh, even companies that had waited for a long time are now acting today. So a bit of pent-up demand, but I think more a positive change in the marketplace going forward. Tony, you want to add to that? I would just say that, um, you know, jointly with healthy new logo activity, to your question, Keith, we're seeing a very solid quarter with significant growth rates on our install base. And it is not just one single solution, right? Uh, when you look across, Accounting Center or Help or Stang or Picon, I mean, uh, you know, people analytics, they're all contributing. So the upselling and cross-selling within a satisfied customer base remains very healthy. So it's, uh, you know, it's really the, the business having good momentum on, on all engines. Excellent. That's the end, you guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Murphy with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yes, thank you, and I'll add my congrats. Um, so, Robin, I, our thinking was that the, the pipeline inflection that you saw a couple of quarters back would not uh, convert to bookings, uh, really, until later this year and, and into next year. And so just given the upside, did, did you see it um, – a bit faster cycle of, of pipeline conversion than normal, or do you, do you kind of still see it lining up uh, relatively more toward year end? Yeah, well, as you know, we always have a really important and strong back half of the year, and that's not changing this year. We did have very, very good pipeline conversion rates in Q2, and maybe, Chano, I'll let you comment on, on that being uh, on the front line there. Uh, hi, Mark. Um, Clearly, some of the land motions convert faster, right? The quarterly strategy in sourcing or some of the planning or PCON standalone motions, those will convert faster than, than the core ACN and core financials products. But uh, obviously, the, the strength coming already from the pipeline that it was uh, built uh, during the second half last year has already started to play out and will play out more during the second half uh, this year. Okay, understood. Uh, thank you. And then, um, just Anil, a quick follow-up for you. I, I was wondering about the, the cadence of finance teams. Uh, that, you know, we know that they paused their spending during the pandemic, and you know now they've been wanting to accelerate their move to the cloud. Do you think that um, is the part of this, um, you know, kind of remaining consistent where they might pull in some of the projects they had planned in 2024, 2025? Um, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, um, with, with the Delta variant headlines in the news, is, is that going to intensify that or, or, or defer that a bit or more of a, more of a zero uh, issue from the Delta variant? You know, t time will tell. Uh, right when we thought we were coming out of the pandemic, we, we get hit with the Delta variant. So it's, it's just such a changing, unpredictable world right now. The last data that I saw from Gartner uh, suggested that projects this, from this year – and for some of next year would be pushed out, but projects from 24 would be pulled into 23. And so, and I think our pipeline suggests that the, the pipeline is getting better for financials, uh, and it should continue to get better. And I think 
going into next year, more projects will get pulled into next year. Understood. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of DJ Hines with Canaccord. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks, guys, and congrats on the on the nice start here uh, to the second uh, to the the first half of the year. Um, I want to ask about the hiring environment in, in progress on that front. Uh, two two questions, maybe one for Robin and, and one for Chano. So, Robin, you're at 900 net new employees of I think you said 2,500 targeted. How does this seasonality, right, 35% in the first half, 65% in the second half, compare to kind of internal plans as, as well as prior years? And, and then. Sean, just given the headcount ramp expected in the second half, if I gave you 10 new sales reps, how, how would you allocate them between hunters versus back-to-base reps? And, and maybe you could talk about maybe how that might be different than it would have been in, you know, a year or two ago. So on over our overall hiring, DJ, so as you know, we came into the year with really, really aggressive hiring plans. Um, I would have hoped we would have been a little further along than 900 at this point, but it took us some time to really ramp the recruiting engine because, as you know, we had paused hiring a lot of last year, so we had to get that going. Um, so it's not surprising that we are going to be back-end loaded. We feel really good about our recruiting engine right now. We feel good that we're going to be able to accelerate hiring into the back half of the year, and we're still targeting those 2,500 hires, so we feel good about where we are, but maybe a little bit of a slower start than what we had hoped coming into the year. Okay. DJ, thanks God uh, Robin is more generous than you and uh, giving me some more headcount than 10. <laughs> but, you know, if I would be to play out with the 10, I would say that the first um, kind of angle I will be looking at geographically, and clearly we are allocating more sales capacity today in international markets where we see a significant opportunity ahead. This is not just for, you know, second half this year, but clearly it's FY23 and beyond as well. So that would be first dimension. The second one would be clearly, um, you know, yes, between a balance between the new logo and install base, but also you need to consider that we have some of the land first motions across uh, PCON or planning or strategic sourcing. So those plays into account as well. And we see opportunity clearly across net, across net new logo activity, across install base, and some of the land motion. So, you know, balance picture uh, across those, uh, and clearly with a more um, pivot investment within our international markets and within North America today. Yeah, okay, perfect. That's helpful color. Thank you, guys. Your next question comes from line of Brad Reebok with Stiefel. Please proceed with your question. Uh, great. Thanks very much. If we think about the $1.1 billion of 24-month backlog increase year over year, are we at a point now where half of that's from new customers versus growth at existing? Any sort of color on that would be super helpful. Yeah, Brad. So as you can imagine, um, the bigger we get and the longer we've been in business, it will shift that backlog component more towards renewals. Um, then net new, so that shift has been something that has been in process for quite some time. Um, this year is, is different, as we pointed out earlier, that we actually have flat renewals year over year, and so we're getting a little bit more of a proportion um, towards net new this year, but we expect that that trend will, um, will reverse again next year as we get back to more normalized uh, renewals growth. Great. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Turritz with KeyBank. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, great. Uh, congrats for the quarter. Very nice. So, um, Robin, the, the, you know, the, it's, it's a nice margin beat and a raise on the year. Seems like it's more than just revenue upside, and this is despite you know the, what has been very aggressive hiring and lots of discussions of, of investment. So, 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 is this a, a change at all in? your operating uh, philosophy or structure such that you're able to get this margin upside and we're accelerating revenue too? Well, you know, a good part of our margin raise was the overperformance on the top line. So that's a very big chunk of it. Uh, we had some expenses, you know, slip from Q2 into the back half of the year, some of our programmatic spend. Um, and as I just mentioned before, we were hoping to do a little faster hiring, so we have some savings from that as well. As we look at next year, though, 
you know, keep in mind that a lot of the hiring we're doing this year is going to have a full year impact next year. Some of the programs we're going to put in place in the back half of this year will roll into next year. We also expect that uh, certain costs will layer back in, such as travel, return to office, um, and hopefully in-person events <laughs> that we can start doing again. Um, additionally, the bonus program that Anil talked about with about a 300 basis point impact on margin, that will continue into next year and beyond. Uh, and so it's a performance-based plan, so it could vary with our results, but we expect that impact to remain fairly consistent through next year if we achieve our targets. Um, keep in mind, though, that the impact from the plan on margins will vary over time based on top-line growth, hiring, and performance against our goals. So just keep all of those things in mind when you think about longer-term margins. Great. That's, that's really helpful. Thanks. And then it sounds like FINS is going very well. Can, can you give us some sense of, you know, where FINS ACV is coming in relative to HCM ACV? So we saw growth in both FINS and, and HCM ACV, and both contributed to our overachievement um, in this year, both contributed to our guidance raise, and we're seeing really strong growth across both of those in our pipeline as well. Yeah, I guess I didn't mean a total. I'm not trying to pull that out of you. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of individual deals, is it coming in at, at larger levels than, than HCM for individual customers? In terms of pricing? or We, we are still, uh, you know, in, in the world of HCM, we sell to absolutely the biggest companies in the world, like, like a CVS Health. And in finance, uh, the, bigger, the bigger companies haven't yet moved to the cloud, but they're beginning to. So right now I'd say the average... HCM customer at the high end is bigger than the finance customer, but that's that's changing, and they will equalize over time. Okay, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Zukin with Wolf Research. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, guys, for taking the question. So I guess one element um, – that, that seems interesting is there's a lot more of these new land motions around, I think you mentioned planning, you mentioned PECON, spend management. I want to get a better understanding how much of the bookings is, is kind of this now coming from this new land motion because it does feel like the opportunity for dollar-based net expansion or expansion and going back into those customers is going to be higher. And so you kind of are opening up this new you know, it, it's a little bit different than historically when you had such a large land that the upsell was more difficult. Yeah, that's in China. Yeah, clearly, clearly, Alec, the, the majority of the dollars are, of course, still coming for the, from the core ACN and the core fins uh, transformation as a whole. These land motions are clearly, you know, where they are providing is much more significant volume of selling particularly on the install base, but as well getting us into new customers that we're expecting to cross-sell later on to our core products. But of course, the majority of the ACB is obviously still from the big, bigger transformation projects. Understood. And then, and Robin, maybe kind of dovetailing on uh, on Michael's question, is it possible to get uh, a little bit more color on some of the, you know, the, the, the tailwinds on margins this year? And, and how to think about them layering out of the model for next year, particularly as, as we get back to some of those you know, pre-COVID go-to-market motions and travel and, um, and, and with the bonus pool? Yeah, you know, so in, in addition to you know, my commentary answering Michael's question, I guess the, the only thing I would add is that we still have a six months to go until we're into next year. Things like travel, how much it comes back are still uncertain. Um, so it's a little hard to predict right now above and beyond the drivers that I mentioned uh, earlier. But we'll share more with you on FY23 margins uh, at a later date when we get closer and we've closed another quarter or two. I, I would add that I, I do think uh, travel and, and uh, entertainment budgets, I think those, have, those will change going forward even when we get out of the pandemic. We, we've just learned how to work smarter without having to have people on site everywhere. Uh, you can do – a lot of work uh, from from your office or from at home, and then you can concentrate the few trips on on really meaningful activities. So, and I, and I don't think that's specific to work. I think that's specific to a lot of companies that were just used to spending a lot of money on travel that that probably will not spend like that again. Perfect.
We will now take two more questions. Your next question comes from the line of Ramo Lenschow with Barclays. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thank you. Thanks for squeezing me in and congrats from me as well. Um, uh, Chano, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the, the new paywalls um, that you announced, uh, I think Germany and Australia, just in terms of the, the international build out, because you know, we all agree there's a big opportunity. The question is like, you know, in terms of financial functionality, uh, HR functionality, are you quite there yet to kind of uh, capitalize on that? And then had one follow up. Yeah, Ramo, we, you know, we, we really understand and acknowledge how important local payrolls are to our strategy and our customers. And if you look at uh, payroll for Germany, and you know that country well, uh, workforce management over there and the number of manufacturing companies when we are providing them as solutions around HCN, having payroll is of tremendous importance for us to capture a bigger part of the market. I could say the same out of Australia. So this is expansion really into these markets is very significant and critical to our strategic uh, initiatives that we do have for growth within our international markets. So we feel very good about it. Obviously, it's going to take us, uh, you know, a couple of years to develop those. But even today, customers knowing that that is our strategy, we think that is going to open more doors for consideration on some customers that are looking more for a provider than obviously can close the loop as well in terms of the pay and the workforce management and, and time tracking and scheduling as a whole, right? When it comes to financials, we just keep uh, been doing uh, improvements in terms of our international capabilities. I think if you look at some of the analysts, they're highlighting those. Some of the customers as well, they're highlighting those too. Uh, and we just uh, keep becoming stronger in terms of our financial uh, solution from an international perspective in terms of the local regulations um, and all basically the localizations that are required. So that in some cases right now is highlighted today more as a strength than any other things when some of our customers are, are becoming guarded customers. And, and honestly, it's also a great point that uh, many are going successfully live uh, in EMEA with our financial solutions, and those are working very nicely and becoming referenceable customers for us. Perfect. Okay, perfect. That's very clear. Thank you. And then w one follow-up, like when we talk with the system integrators, they, seem, they are seeing a lot more activity of people sketching out, you know, you know, uh, you know mapping out processes, et cetera, which is kind of a first step to kind of towards like changing uh, the, the finance system. Uh, what are you seeing there in terms of how quickly those kind of projects are evolving in terms of like, uh, and, and also kind of showing up for, for you guys, are we still in the same pre-pandemic cadence of like six to nine months kind of lead time of kind of trying to sketch out what you want to do and how you want to do it and then doing it? Or do you see an acceleration there because people realize there's a little bit more urgency here? Thank you and congrats from me as well. Yeah, it's a great question. What we're seeing is I think more projects taking place. Uh, that is obvious. As you are saying, some customers are doing what they call kind of a phase zero, which is this mapping of the processes and understanding what is will be the, you know, the the near the the, the future compared to with the ASIS kind of processes that they do have today, and they're working that with the system integrators. But uh, I think those A are being worked faster because there is more urgency there for transformation, being all the pains that and difficulties that some customers have been facing during the pandemic phase. And B, clearly, uh, you know, there are many more projects taking place as well around the financial transformation. It's gradual improvement is what we're seeing there as more customers are moving finances to the cloud. Perfect. Thank you. Your final question comes from the line of Scott Berg with Needham & Company. Please proceed with your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, congrats on the quarter, and thanks for taking my question. Um, so first off, you just announced the company achieved ready status for the FedRAMP program. How should we think about the sales opportunity in that segment, and what products do you expect those customers will adopt the most? Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's already in motion. We already have uh, customers in the federal government. They're more quasi-fed agencies than full fed agencies that are using Workday. And as we go through the cycle, you know, it's a long sales cycle, but, but those sales cycles will, will begin, and, and we're fully on the schedule uh, middle of next year. So I would, start, I would think you'll start seeing the pipeline build and, and hopefully some good, good wins 
beginning to happen, quasi-agencies first and then full agencies uh, sometime next year. Uh, you know, in in terms of HR and financials, there we're we're a good fit. We're going to find we're, we're going to find requirements that we're going to have to build specifically for federal government, uh, but but we are in general a good fit for both uh, for both solutions for the federal government. Great, thank you. Um, and then just one more quick one. Um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, kind of talking about Australia and Germany and the expansion there. Um, with payroll, um, can you give us a little bit of color on, you know, how much further should we expect uh, the company to take its payroll functionality um, kind of after those two markets are complete? You know, I, I, I'd, I'd expect that we're going to continue to in, invest in payroll integration across the globe. Uh, we might add one or two more payrolls over the next few years, uh, but you're not going to see us add 10 uh, you know, un, un, unless we unless we find a great company to acquire, which we haven't which we haven't seen yet, uh, what we are doing is going country by country, and where we don't have a payroll, really trying to build a, a tighter tighter integration, which, which right. is honestly what most of our customers do with uh, with their global payroll uh, demands, anyways. Awesome, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation on today's conference. This will conclude Workday's second quarter fiscal year 22 earnings call. Thank you again for joining us.